You are listening to Up Talk with Sean Conahan. The gloves are off, and it's time to have a chat. Hello, people, and welcome to episode eight of the podcast. Sorry, we're a little delayed. My new work schedule threw a wrench in the works a little bit, uh, being away from home for a few weeks at a time. So probably won't be on the same day of the month from uh, this point forward, but we'll definitely be at least once a month, if not a couple times a month. So you'll have to just keep on top of it and subscribe to the channels that you listen to the podcast on if you can. That way you'll automatically get new episodes downloaded. And you won't have to keep looking for them. They'll just appear. So that would be great. As always, we are brought to you by wonderful sponsors, the Compass Rose Health and Wellness Center, Rest Ed Seminars, Daniel Sundahl Photography, and Life Shield First Aid Training. Check them out at uptalkpodcast.com, your one-click stop for everything Uptalk, and uh, check them out. That'd be great. As always, a warning for those of you that may have some trigger issues. There may be some conversations in this podcast that may cause some triggers for you, so just make sure you're in a good headspace uh, before you start to listen so you can enjoy it to the fullest. Also, I think that due to the summer months being upon us and my work schedule, I'll probably stick to having one guest instead of two, just so I don't have to track as many people down. But that will also mean more episodes. They'll be shorter, but there'll be more of them, which is a good thing, I think. So I hope you enjoy this episode as much as uh, I enjoyed making it, and let's get going. My guest for this episode is a 31-year veteran of the police force. He's also a member of the Order of Merit in Policing. He is the author of 56 Seconds and How to Survive PTSD and Build Peer Support. He's a senior team lead for the Canadian National Peer and Trauma Support Systems team for the Mood Disorder Society of Canada and is a senior advisor for Badge of Life Canada. I'm going to go ahead and call him the godfather of peer support in Canada and welcome Sid Gravel to the podcast. Hi, Sid. How are you today? I'm well, thank you, and, and, and thanks for calling, Sean. No, it's my pleasure for sure. If, if our listeners haven't, uh, don't know much about you or haven't heard of you, they're certainly going to be uh, a fan of yours uh, by the time we're done, I'm sure. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, Sid, maybe you could just start off by just giving everybody a little history about yourself and your, your mental health journey. Sure. Uh, so I'm a, it's, in a nutshell, I'm a, a PTSD survivor for 28 years now. So I'm one of the old fellows that, uh, <laughs> you know, we talk about some of the things happening way back when and how come we never heard of, about it way back when. Right. Well, the truth of the matter is, is back in 1987 when I was uh, diagnosed with PTSD as a result of my being involved in a uh, shooting incident uh, related to my being a police officer here in Ottawa. Right. Um, we were very quiet uh, about the fact that we had uh, a mental injury at the time. They they referred to it as shell shock. Yes. Uh, and um, it was new in terms of uh, police uh, involvement. It was very much something that was being studied by a lot of psychologists who were interested in that field uh, by their study of people who were coming back from Vietnam. There were a lot of Canadians right. involved in that war. Mm. And uh, so when someone like me came along, uh, you know, and got diagnosed by them, uh, it wasn't something that we talked about. So, right. uh, so back in 1988, uh, I met up with uh, six other police officers. All of us had been uh, through that journey of, of uh, being diagnosed. And all of us were very quiet about it, uh, very secretive about it. And uh, we agreed, with the help of uh, our psychologist, uh, to meet once uh, a month and just uh, support each other, share with each other what we were having difficulties with and seeing if we could, in commonality, come up with some way of making each other feel better. Right. And over time, uh, we became very good at doing that and keeping ourselves at work. Um, you know, uh, we uh, agreed to help others who were involved in such incidents as well. And so we quietly uh, 
uh, kept an eye to the an ear to the ground in terms of who was doing what in our area. And so as incidents happened, we reached out to them and let them know that they weren't alone, that we were there mm. for them. And uh, over time, we grew to having well over 100 people that we had reached out to. Wow. Uh, but interesting enough, in spite of all those people being involved in support and supporting each other, we always remained a core group of about six or seven members who were true peers, who were who were quite willing to put themselves out there to help others. Right. And what we really were pleased with and um, for the rest is that they took care to get themselves better and, and left it at that. We, that's, we, we really didn't want to impose upon them to take on other people's burdens and journeys, which peer work can do. Yeah. Absolutely. And we wanted very, yeah. we wanted very much that they just took care of themselves and got better. And so, yeah, and then uh, in 1990, people started talking about, the 1990s, people started talking about PTSD. Mm. Uh, and then we recognized that, and our doctor, of course, pointed that out to us, that that was what, where we lived. You know, interesting enough, we stayed on the job at the time. Uh, wow. We, we, all of us, uh, ended up uh, completing our careers. But, uh, you know, there, there we went, but by the grace of God, really. Uh, right. We, because we took care of each other very quickly and in a peer, informal peer setting, and we were very careful to be there for each other. It didn't matter if it was 3 o'clock in the morning, on a Sunday morning, uh, if somebody needed to, to talk to somebody else and be at a coffee shop to talk, and then we would do that. And, now, Sid, I mean, obviously you guys had an awesome peer group to, to support each other at the time because it wasn't something that was talked about hardly at all was I mean what was your employer supportive of us what you guys were trying to do and going through well actually they didn't know about us uh, right. very much at the beginning and then finally one of us realized we realized that one of us had to be a public face yeah uh, especially to let the staff sergeants and sergeants know that they could reach out to us if, if need be right uh, so being the youngest guy in the group, I got thrown under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and needless to say, it was quite the adventure because I did get threats. Yeah. Uh, I did get threats from uh, some of the senior officers. Uh, wow. They were quite upset that I was making them apparently look bad. And, uh, and, huh. uh, and yet, uh, you know, uh, they said, well, we do care. And my response was, well, show me how because... If we're not responding, I don't see a whole heck of a lot of others responding. Right. So, uh, anyways, over a period of time, they came to respect us. And it was interesting because the guys on the streets would call us. If there was a shooting, a stabbing, or anything like that, they would call us. Okay. And we'd go into the station, and we'd talk to the officer and uh, the staff sergeants and the middle managers. In fact, they all appreciated it. Right. Uh, and at some point, the executive took an interest, and finally, finally, I got called in by one of the chiefs of the time, and he basically said, "So, what is it that you want?" And uh, I said, "Well, quite clearly, we know what we're doing. So, we basically don't want you interfering with our ability to do what we're doing, and we would appreciate some support in that." If I'm coming in at 3 o'clock in the morning, which means I've been up since 2, mm. and I'm probably going to start my day shift going right into the afternoon, if by 3 o'clock in the afternoon I'm tired out, let me go home and don't punish me. Right. And the other thing is is that anybody who wanted to talk to me uh, was afraid to be labeled, so I ended up having to travel to a lot of smaller towns surrounding Ottawa. Right. To meet with people who wanted to talk and have coffee with them there so that they wouldn't be seen with the guy who was the face of PTSD. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so I said, you know, I, I'm spending a lot of money on coffee and gas. I said, I wouldn't mind just a slush fund to help pay for that. Right. So he said, yeah, we can have that. And at the end of the day, I think they put $2,000 into account for Robin's Blue Circle, which was what we called ourselves. Right. And when I retired, I think there was $2,300 there because the interest had grown. We never used our money. We didn't need it. It was just a symbol of the yeah. fact that we wanted them to support us. And right. we continued to work on our own time and dime, and we always had. Wow, that is awesome. I mean, 
that that's great that you were able to do that and that you got some buy-in and were able to continue your work, whether you use the money or not. Yeah. That's awesome. And um, how how far how much later than that or at what time did you start to uh, did you write your book your first book? So what happened? I retired, of course, and uh, I had an opportunity now to feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, with the journey and uh, what it was that we were trying to accomplish and what we had done. And so I decided to go public uh, with the fact that Robin's Blue Circle existed. And, of course, I was very conscious of the fact that, you know, uh, there was privacy issues here and confidentiality issues here because, you know, we one of the things that we always said about ourselves is that what was said within our group uh, was said because someone needed help and said it because they needed help, but it, right. it didn't need to go any further than that, so it never did. Uh, so the book was written in very general terms, of, in, in an overview of what we did, why we did it, how we did it, and ultimately what came of it, and some of the things that management needed to know if they were going to see such groups exist within their organizations how to support them without interfering with their So abilities. was this, uh, sorry, Sid, was this the book, How to Survive PTSD and Build Peer Support? No, the first one was 56 Seconds. Okay, very good, sorry. Yeah, 56 okay. Seconds was the first one. Right. And when I put that out there, I had absolutely no idea what kind of reaction I would get. Mm. Uh, and, and I was, at, you know, I said to my wife at the, at the time that it went out, I said, you know, if I get one person saying it helped them, then maybe it was all worth it. Uh, well, it never stopped. People were were uh, uh, calling me and emailing me and telling me how much it meant to them. Wow. And interesting enough, Sean, here's an interesting thing. Some people read it and said, you know, I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and then other people read it and said, oh, I couldn't get past page 15. It, it meant so much to me. Wow. And so I realized then that, Unless you're really been a part of that journey, even if it's vicariously, right? It's pretty hard sometimes to understand what it is that we go through. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that yeah. sometimes, you know, that's the whole stigma issue, you know, where judgment is made on the basis of our own personal experiences as opposed to the experiences that others are lived by. Yeah. And uh, and sometimes in that judgment we can be rather cruel because it just doesn't make sense to us. No, and I think people are are scared of the unknown, especially when it comes to mental health. I mean, there's Absolutely. so many, you know, so many ideas people have in their head of what people look like that may be having trouble with mental health. And I think it, you know, for some people, they just can't they can't bring themselves to come to grips with it, and they're just they're scared of what it looks like to them. Yeah, and I've seen that in real life. Uh, we had an officer who, uh, God bless his soul, he's passed away now. And he turned out to be a dear friend of mine. But initially when we met, he was very uh, anti, uh, you can't show weakness uh, if right. you're wearing a uniform. He was very uh, bullying, uh, very aggressive in his comments and derogatory in terms of me personally as a weak person was his comments. Wow. <laughs> Until one day he had a gun pointed at his head and he just barely survived that incident. Huh. You know, several weeks after his incident, he called me and asked if he could speak. And uh, I remember he walked into the room. We had a boardroom. He wanted to meet some of us as survivors. And each and every one of us had shot someone or been shot and survived. So we were all front page news at some point in time. And uh, so I got 12 people together, and uh, this officer walked in to the room, and he stood at the door, and he stopped dead in his tracks, and he looked around to each one of us, pointing his finger at each of us. Mm. And he said, this is one hell of a club you've got here. The price of entry is too high. Wow. And he became one of our best advocates. That's a great statement to make. That yeah. That's really heavy. Like, that's a real powerful statement. Yeah. And, uh, but for me, it was a real awakening in terms of the difference between sympathy and empathy. Right. You know, that whole thing about empathy being, I've walked in your shoes, me too, I understand, no need to go further. Mm. Compared to sympathy, where in sympathy you say, well, at least it's not as bad as trying to make yeah. it sound better than it really is. No, I, yeah, absolutely right. And then... So how long after that did that lead to the second book of How to Survive PTSD and Build Peer Support? 
Yeah, so what happened there, 56 seconds was basically um, a story. Right. And uh, with some, you know, with some lessons in there and five questions that we, we ask people. But uh, Dr. Anna Baranowski, who runs the Traumatology, the, the Trauma Institute in Toronto. Right. Uh, very well known in her field by many psychologists and many people in the field of trauma, uh, connected with me and she said, great book, but you know, you, you have an opportunity to teach people from this kind of a book and, you know, maybe we should get together and put something that's a teaching book. And so, uh, how to survive PTSD and build peer support is, is basically a teaching book. It's a book okay. that takes people away from that fog of ignorance about, I really don't know what it's all about. Uh, well, this book is, just, you know, I put it in simple language in terms of right. what it's about and what can be done to make things better. There's 25 teaching points that come out of the book. And interesting enough, Mohawk College in Hamilton picked up on that right away. Huh. And I got a call from them and they said, you know, we would like to make this book mandatory reading for our third year health and wellness uh, program. Oh, perfect. Yeah. At Mohawk College. And they did. They, it's been mandatory reading for about three years now. That's great. Yeah. And uh, what I do for them is uh, once a year, if they ask, this year they haven't, but that's not uh, any reflection. Sometimes it's just in terms of what they have going on. But uh, what I do is uh, once a year I go in and I speak to the graduating students about the stories behind uh, some of the chapters in the book where, you know, stuff is written, but there's stories behind why it's written. Right. And I share that with them over a couple of hours. And I do that just as a courtesy and appreciation for the fact that they use my book as mandatory reading. That's great. I mean, that's that's a very valuable couple hours they're going to have there when they, they may not know it yet. But at one point, they're going to look back on that and just realize how valuable that that teaching time was. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, and I hope so, because I say that when I'm talking to them. I say, you know, I'm, I'm talking to some future chiefs here in the audience, so you better remember this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, did you did you have, uh, you know, some organizations and agencies approach after that second book and, you know, wanting to get their programs, you know, either up and running or tweak them to be more efficient or effective? Did you Did you find that at all? Well, organizations, no, not so much organizations. I have had or many organizations ask me to come and speak on the basis of what's in those books. Right. Uh, and also, uh, you know, some of the things that I share that aren't in the books, really, because, uh, you know, the books are written in a certain way, but there's still lessons and things that have I've lived with and, and, and shared with people that aren't in there as well. So they, you know, they'll ask me to do family nights or they'll ask me to do an intro to PTSD or to trauma survival or trauma management. So those kinds of conversations. Right. Organizationally, that's what I get. But what I did get a lot of is individuals saying, I want to start my own informal peer support group because we really okay. think informal is the way to go. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I've been at their beck and call. Uh, I asked them to read the book first, please, and that way there's not a whole lot of questions that they're asking over again. And then uh, I'm available to them, you know, any time of, of day or night kind of thing. And, you know, okay, what do you want clarified? How do we manage that part? How do we deal with this? And uh, I share with them my experiences mm. based on my years of doing that. And if it fits, great. If it doesn't, then we have a conversation about what would fit and see how it works for them. So there's been a lot of individuals right. who have looked to, uh, to the books uh, for guidance in terms of informal peer support, which I am, by the way, a huge fan of. Well, have you ever, do you know or ever spoke to Jamie McWhorter? Jamie McWhorter. McWhorter, you know who that is? I'm trying to think of the name. It, he's uh, he's in the military. He's a Newfoundlander, and he started PTSD Buddies on Facebook. Oh, okay. He's uh, he's the one who headed up that big support group. If you, if you guys haven't spoken before, I'm going to have to get you guys connected because yeah, I'd like you that. guys would have a great chat. He was on uh, an earlier episode of the podcast. And, Perfect. Uh, when you say PTS Buddies, that rings a bell. But so so I, I might have uh, crossed paths with that Facebook page. Right. So that'd be wonderful to connect with him directly. Well, I yeah. definitely, I'll definitely connect you uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take you off on a little bit of a side note here, just because I'm interested in your opinion on something. I think a lot of people or a lot of organizations may get uh, peer support and critical incident stress debriefing sometimes a little bit mixed up, or or think that they are. 
they, they sort of use them one and the same, and they're not. They're definitely not. They're very different. Right. And I'm just wondering, for you in this industry, there's obviously been a lot of talk about critical incident stressor briefings recently as far as yes. if they are beneficial or if they do more harm than good. And right. I'm, just, I'm wondering, you know, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, so I, I think you're bang on because, in fact, uh, uh, Nick Carlton, Professor Nick Carlton of the University of Regina, is actually, I believe he's already started a study, a survey to police organizations and to police associations to that exact point. Okay. Because what he's saying, and I agree, is that a lot of police chiefs are saying, yeah, well, we have critical incident stress, so we do have peer support. Yeah, exactly. And... Uh, yeah, and, and he's saying, well, it's, did you not know it's two different things? And they're kind of saying, well, no, we have peer support because we have critical distance stress. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're not, <laughs> they're not getting it. Uh, so it is, it is an issue. Critical incident stress, uh, you know, has its place in terms of, uh, incidents happening, um, uh, within, uh, organizations where, you know, some formality may be, uh, the norm right. in terms of dealing with it, especially if you have doctors involved who want to talk to everybody at once. I'm very, very leery of critical incident stress management being run uh, without uh, uh, the proper mental health uh, person involved, whether right. it's a certified social worker yes. or psychologist. Um, and I think that that's where some of the harm has come in the past with the Mitchell model. It's a wonderful model if we're done properly. And I think sometimes people have gotten a little bit lazy in terms of how they use it or a bit too free on how they've used it. That I mean, you, you brought up a good point. And I think organizations need to realize that how important it is that if you do have a, a, you know, a formal critical incident stress briefing after an incident, how important it is to have a certified mental health representative at that debriefing. Absolutely. Because you don't know how somebody's going to react. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, you may open the door to somebody uh, revealing uh, a great deal of hurt at a time, and, and that's when they're going to need a uh, proper reaction uh, and support to that, uh, to that uh, revelation. And uh, not having somebody who's capable of handling that uh, is, is, can, can turn out to be quite embarrassing and, uh, and damaging. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, yeah. Now, interestingly enough, the Royal Ottawa Hospital here in Ottawa, um, they um, they actually looked at uh, how we do debriefings, and they said, look, if an organization does a good job of letting their people know what resources are available to them when a critical or traumatic event happens, right. People will listen, but not really click in, right? They'll say, okay, yeah. that's great information to have, but unless I really need it, I'm not going to really store it too far in the forefront of my brain here. Mm -hmm. So what happens is all of a sudden something very traumatic or critical happens, and then they say, you know what, I remember three years ago they told me we had resources, but I can't remember Dick right now. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so right. that's where the Royal Ottawa Hospital said, you know, instead of instead of critical incident debriefings, which sometimes can do some harm if not done right, and we're never really sure here who's going to be taking the lead on that, right? we'd be more safe if you did psychological first aid and just basically reminded people. Now, remember when we told you about dramatic events and being involved in these kinds of events, what resources were available? Well, here's a list of the resources again. Here's a list of the professionals again. Here's a list of the peer support team workers that we have formally, but we also have an informal team. If you don't want to speak to somebody organizationally, we have a list of people who are available informally as well. And that way, by the time people are finished that information session, they come out of it feeling like I've got what I need and I'll, I'll make use of it on my own good time. Perfect. Because, I mean, I think one of the things that shoots us in the foot as first responders, like our personalities are such that they help us in doing, you know, our first response jobs, but parts of our personalities hurt us a lot, and that being as soon as we're told, that something is mandatory. Someone calls you up and says that we have a mandatory debriefing that you have to come to. For some reason, we automatically get our backs up. Like even if it's the best thing that we could do for ourselves, we automatically get our back up and say, "Well, I'm not. You you can't tell me what to do. Yeah. Like I, I own me. 
Yeah. And I'll come if I want to. But as soon as you tell me I have to come, we yeah. automatically get our get our walls up. You Absolutely. Know? And, uh, you know, after uh, after I was involved in my second shooting where I sh- uh, for me, um, I had been involved again in other incidents where uh, use of force was such a, you know, shots were fired, et cetera. So I was part a parcel of the group of officers who was called in for a debriefing. Right. And I got to tell you, Sean, you know, being a PTSD survivor and having gone through all the shit that I went through, when I went into those debriefings that were organized by the police service, I basically just sat there with my arms crossed and stared at the ceiling until these guys were out of my way. Wow. And then I went and talked to my own doctor. Right. When I, and my own peers when I was ready to. Yeah. You know. I think, you know, we can't. It's hard because we know we need help and we know that we should be doing the briefings and we should be doing regular self maintenance. Yeah. But really all we can do is make sure that, like you said, we, that everybody knows where the resources are. Make sure that the four walls of our fire station or police station or ambulance station are safe to talk in. Yeah. Other than that, because we need to, the first step needs to be taken by the person. You need to want to help yourself. Yeah, and no. what's important here, Sean, is that they have a clear understanding and are reminded once again that uh, traumatic brain injury uh, from a, an event such as uh, something that causes horror, fear, right. loss of control, loss of safety, uh, can can be uh, embedded quite deeply and physically in your brain if mm. you don't address to it within four weeks. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so they need to be reminded that, and they need to be reminded of what some of the signs or symptoms are, like, you know, you're going home and you're disconnecting from a conversation that your family's having with you because suddenly you're having a flashback. Right. Or suddenly you're perspiring crazily uh, as if you're in a battle and, 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 and you're standing there doing the dishes or whatever. Hmm. Uh, or all of a sudden, like what I would often do is I would end up with a broken record in my brain saying, did I react too fast? Did I react too fast every yeah. fast, and you get into that loop and so people say well what does it look like so they need to be reminded that's what it looks like and so if you're starting to do this kind of stuff you don't mess around with that that's an injury right uh you know and and the other thing uh, you know one of the pieces of advice i got from my old staff sergeant at the time was sit go home and have a few drinks and you'll feel better <laughs> after. well you know what i didn't feel better after a few drinks so i had a few more drinks and right. uh, next thing i knew uh i was drinking myself to sleep and then i wasn't sleeping so i would drink myself into a stupor right and then you still tried to go to work and put a smile on your face and the next thing you know you're making things complicated because now not only are you dealing with the fact that you have ptsd which is a physical Physical injury, but you've complicated it now with the possibility of creating some sort of an addiction to uh, to alcohol or drugs in order to to get a, a night's sleep. Right, which is all too familiar in this scenario. Yeah, um, yeah, you know for sure. Uh, Sid, what? Tell me a little bit about your your role with um, the Badge of Life Canada. Well, um, um, love the site, by the way, and I love the organization. And I say that in complete bias, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, back in 2012, Peter Platt, who and I, who and I, he and I worked together with the Ottawa Police Service. Right. So Peter had uh, gone through uh, quite a difficult uh, journey in, in himself, uh, ended up in, in an institute for addiction, uh, and uh uh, he wanted to help out other officers, and he noted uh, it, when he started in 2011 that there was a lot of resources being put out there at the federal level, which is for the military, which included the RCMP. Right. But when it came to municipal and provincial police officers, firefighters, EMS, those kinds of people, right, there's not a whole lot available because we don't fall under that federal framework and that federal budget. Right, yes. Yeah. So he wanted to put something together, and he asked me if I would help him. And he had already started to put a template together called Badge Life Canada, and it was based on Badge Life USA. Okay. And then, and then in 2012, he asked if I would help him. And then from there, what we, we tried to do is Canadianize it a little bit more, uh, really look for resources provincially, municipal wise, uh, to make sure that if somebody connected to the site that within seconds or within a minute or two, they could find the resources that they were looking for. 
Yeah, the, and, uh, the, we, uh, the site's awesome for that, actually. Oh, thank if you. No, if you haven't seen it yet, any of the listeners need to go to it and have a look, because you can click on the area that you live in, and it'll give you a, a rundown of the professionals in your area that you can go talk to and a list of resources. It's, it's excellent. Yeah, and it's continuing to grow. That's the wonderful thing about it. I mean, if you're in an area where your, your community is small and, you know, it's a couple hundred miles to the next community and it's a small community too, mm. uh, you may find that our resources are a bit weak because there aren't any there at, at this point. But as people are finding out about Badge of Life Canada, they're, they're, they're telling us that, hey, I'm here and I'm willing to help. And so we're saying, yeah, we're going to make you available. To people, nice. and you know, so that's what we're looking at. Peter uh, has uh, made it known that he's not well, and we've subsequently found he's got cancer, and so we were quite concerned that Badger Life Canada would not continue because it was his baby at the time, right? Uh, and he devoted his entire time and, and dime to it, and so we reached out uh, to uh, a lot of people throughout Canada who might have an interest in stepping up to the plate and working with us to keep it going, and we met uh, Bill and Lynn Rusk. Right. Uh, who, who knew Peter before, and uh, Gary Ruby and myself, uh, you know, got together and, and we're now keeping it going on Peter's in Peter's name. But uh, it's grown phenomenally, and uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's getting quite large now. Absolutely, no, it's a fantastic uh, organization. And then also, you're involved with the Mood Disorder Society of Canada. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so what happened in, uh, I've always said that in spite of the fact that I'm a huge fan of the informal peer support process. Right. Versus the, for, the formal, which organizations run. Right. Um, we still need to make sure that the information we're giving is correct and safe and within the parameters of doing no harm. And uh, informal peer support is based on a lot of lived experience, but sometimes we get asked advice from people, and we need to make sure that we're giving the right advice. Right. So I always hoped that there would be some way that we would have that kind of training that was available to us um, that would uh, that would inform us of what we need. And the Mental Health Commission of Canada in 2014 came out with the guidelines for the selection and training of peers. And in the guidelines, they identified 17 objectives that need to be addressed if you're going to be a peer uh, in terms of uh, uh, working as a peer and and being as supportive and uh, uh, as creative as you can be in, in helping people move forward without doing them or yourself harm. Right. So I, so I wrote a curriculum. I wrote a two-day curriculum using those 17 objectives. And the Mood Disorder Society of Canada, being a national organization, uh, felt that they were the perfect vehicle to help put it out there and let people know about it and organizations know about it. So, uh, yeah, so they picked it up and I became their team lead in terms of the training and, and, yeah. and stuff. So, yeah, so they're just in the process now of putting it out there and marketing. But now I feel, I feel like it's nice for informal groups to be able to say that you, here's some training you can take. Absolutely. And, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, we'll have links to. I'll make sure we put all these links on uh, on the podcast website so that people can yeah. have a look, as, as well as for your books, as well. Uh, Sid, how can people reach out to you on social media? Uh, they, they can reach me directly through my website at 56secondsbook.com. There's a connection there for contact. Oh, perfect. Yeah, and um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, I. I if you put my name on Google, there's all sorts of information that comes <laughs> up there. So it's, I'm not hiding anymore. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and we mean, have how a, are you, you? You say that, Sid. I didn't even ask. I mean, how are you doing today? How, how do you, you know, how's your how's your daily routine now? Well, my daily routine is very structured. I, I'm also very careful of the fact that you know one of the things that I tell people about PTSD is that it never really goes away. Uh, what you become good at. Uh, if you can accept the fact that you have it, is you can become very good at living with it right. and, and, and reacting. So I still have my moments where I have some difficulty, especially if I'm sharing my story with someone who wants to hear the story right. uh, so that they can connect with me. Or sometimes I'm listening to their story, and it's very impactful on me. So what I'm discovering is that instead of being, instead of being down and depressed for a week or so after that, uh, I'm down for you know several hours, and I can pick myself up pretty quickly now. Uh, what I do is I yeah. do uh, I do meditation twice a day. Okay. 
Uh, I do meditation twice a day for 20 minutes, and then I also, which is something I learned from the Sparta program, which is brand new in Canada, and I'd love to tell you about that someday. We will definitely have you on again and talk about that for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's a, just a wonderful program. And what it deals with is the third pillar of mental health, injury, mental injuries. So the first pillar is, phys- is the physical side, which is where you've got medicines involved. Right. The second pillar is the psychology side, where you're looking at the various therapies that are available. Right. But the third pillar, and where we are now looking at, and a lot of people are looking at it because they're wondering why some people aren't getting healed with the first two pillars, right. is because they're not looking at the injury to the soul, the, the, mm-hmm. injured, the injured spirit, the injured, you know, that spirit that says, I can't get happy anymore. Right. You know, that's, that's, that has to be addressed. And the Sparta program is a, is a, a program in the States. It's coming here to Canada under the direction of Dr. Joanne New. Okay. And she's calling it uh, Project Trauma Support. And, and it's about dealing with the moral injury. And it's a wonderful program. Oh, perfect. I've actually been talking with her a little bit. She's actually going to, she wants to come on as a guest. So. Oh, good. Well, uh, yeah. we'll definitely get into that. Yeah, you definitely have to hear out because uh, Sean and I went for the five and a half days. I'm 64 years old. <laughs> I went for the five and a half days, and I got to tell you, it, it's been years since I felt as comfortable as I did because when I walked in that room and I saw all the pain on those guys' faces because of everything that they'd survived, right. I felt right at home. I said, man, I'm in a room with people that I know. Nice. And three days later, man, I'll tell you, we were close because we didn't have to say anything. We could just see it in each other's eyes. It was just amazing. And, and you know, when you get to that point in life where you just feel yeah. like you're lonely and all of a sudden you're meeting a whole bunch of people who are in the same boat, mm. it's quite, quite, it's quite exciting. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, Sid, before I let you go, I just want to know if you could say something to any listeners that maybe are struggling with right now with mental illness or PTSD in particular, if you could say something to them, what would it be? Yeah, what I would say is that, you know, yes, it, it hurts. There's no two ways about it. And, and that cannot be taken away from what you're going through. But you need to really believe that, in all the efforts that you put to therapy and to uh, use of medicines, if that's what you're doing, uh, to your family and to your loved ones and those who really care, if you lean on them because you can't do this by yourself, things will get better. I truly believe that things do get better when we recognize that this is something that we can't do by ourselves. It only gets difficult when we think we can do it by ourselves. Perfect. Very well said, sir. I want to thank you again for taking the time uh, time out to come on the podcast, and I think everything you're doing is is great, and I want to thank you for your work. Just let you know that if we can ever be of any help to you, just to let us know, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Well, it's been a pleasure for me too, Sean, and I just put you on my speed dial, so... All perfect. You're, you're committed now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again, uh, Sid, and please uh, take care, and all the best to you and yours. All right. Thanks, Sean. And now, it's time for Clinically Speaking with Dr. McGee. Okay, Robin, how are you today? I'm good, thank you. Awesome. Thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Uh, today, you wanted to talk to us about first responder core values and how that relates to PTSD. Yeah, well, what I wanted to say about that is, um, you know, the reason people become first responders in the first place is because they're good. They're good people. These are so people who are committed to saving others from harm. And uh, the whole idea of um, the it's sort of the epitome of help giving, giving, giving help to people in crisis in the the worst possible moment of life in the middle of a fire or, you know, when they're Mm. hurt on the highway or something. And just it's the it's uh, people who go into this walk of life are uh, do it because they believe in um, that as humans, we're here to help each other. And that's why we're that's why we're on the planet is to help each other and to to Mm. do our best for each other. And that's uh that's the purpose and meaning of of life, and um, you know those, of course, are wonderful values. All obviously also shared by psychologists, so um, and many other uh, professions. So, you know, this is what I've seen 
is that um, these values lead people to the work and lead people to be often extremely fulfilled uh, by the work they do. And, you know, uh, the the problem I've sometimes seen is when uh, first responders might hold themselves to an impossibly high standard with respect to those values. So if a call yeah. goes badly or if, you know, the fire can't be put out, like uh, as we're seeing out west. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that they, 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 the, a feeling of, I have somehow failed. I am not a helper. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm, I'm in some sense responsible even for the, the bad outcome, uh, that that person had, even when there's many, many factors that result in the bad outcome that are well beyond the, yeah, that, control that, that of any given that's, individual. Sometimes that's hard to see in the well, moment or even, even for a while afterwards. I know for me it's terribly, it was terribly difficult. I, I take things really hard, especially near the end of my my career as a paramedic. When things were starting to bother me, I would take it really hard and bring it home with me. Well, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, uh, if that's natural, because people want to do a good job, so that they'll be thinking and thinking, oh, gee, you know, if I could only do that over, let me do it over. So there's a lot of operational review in a person's mind about how this is what went wrong with that call, and and that's all constructive at some level. Mm. Uh, and that's why sometimes uh, critical incident debriefs can be very handy because it's sort of, oh, so that's why that, you know, machinery wasn't operative or whatever, <laughs> you know, the kind of thing that, uh, so people can forgive themselves for, um, for, uh, how badly things go because they learn that there are in fact factors beyond their control that they weren't aware of at the time, but come to learn, yeah. uh, when they do an operational debrief. So that's, um, that can be uh, restorative, but at the same time, I guess it goes back to that uh, super high standard that if the standard is I must succeed every single call I make, I must do that, that that's, that's just not possible. It's just not. Um, right. Because by definition, you were, people are intervening in situations that are at a point of extreme critical uh, danger for, for, uh, for many and including the responders. So that, so the, anyway, that 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 core value can um, be therapeutic, though too. And um, I guess I want to tell um, a story about how um, what I've seen around how values uh, attached to first responding can actually be therapeutic and oh, okay, yeah, and wonderful. And uh, yeah. and it, the, the story was uh, was this um, is a, a female first responder. A paramedic, and she had um, had a number of really bad bad calls, and some of which involved her own family members. So oh, when wow. she got to the place, there was her own loved ones, um, mm. you know, having heart attacks or and so on, and so the the in car accidents and so forth. So you know, one of the very first pieces of uh, uh, criteria for PTSD or contributing to PTSD is a threat not only to oneself but to one's family. So a heightened right. sense of danger to one's loved ones is a whole other side of of how people get triggered for uh, post-traumatic stress. Anyway, uh, so this happened to her repeatedly, and then she had a call from a, a neighborhood that was a neighborhood where her, her family um, resides. But when she got to the scene, um, the individual had... Um, had passed away. Uh, she was arrived. The person who had, was deceased, but had been deceased for several days. But in a context which I, I probably won't uh, repeat the details of it, but right. I'll, okay. I'll leave it to say that it was extremely, extremely gruesome. It was okay. a natural death. It was a nat- It was a heart attack. Right. The person had fallen in a way and in a in a in a in an um, in an environment that that uh, that made their the discovery of their body particularly. Uh, oh wow! Okay. Horrible. And so. Having to assess the body, and as she did, the, the, the body sort of came apart in her hands uh, in, in, a, in a disturbing, extremely disturbing way. So she was right. extremely triggered by uh, by that, and that was that was the call that she that was the last straw for her. So mm. after that, she had a, a number of serious PTSD symptoms that followed. So, for example, she anytime she heard a siren, even in the distance, it would trigger tremendous upset and, and uh, Absolutely, yeah. so on. So all those things that are very familiar to, to to many of our listeners today about those kinds of things. So she was just um, just very disturbed. And so part of the um, issue had to do with she had a sort of a memory of the sensation of the touch of the of the person. So that the person had um, 
had melted and uh and so when she ever she touched something that had the consistency of say glue or, right. or a thick syrup or whatever she would have a a traumatic reaction remembering what it was like to touch a, a person who had who had melted and uh so she was so she had this uh, it was a triggering in just regular everyday life as well as um you know with auditory triggers so in her work, she, she, you know, she came and she, um, for therapy and she wanted to work on, um, uh, through EMDR. And, and in the course of that, uh, of that treatment, one of the things that, um, that I, I, I saw and I've seen in her case and I've seen in subsequent cases is the responder, as they're working through the traumatic moment, they are able to make a connection with the idea of the deceased person as a living person, as a real mm. person, as a person who, um, uh, if that person could speak, what would they say to that first responder? They would say, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that you treated my remains with dignity. I'm so grateful that you, um, you know, spoke to me in the last moments of my life and gave me comfort. I'm so grateful that if, if these people, you know, so somehow being able to connect with the, that, that core value, I'm here to help, right. that even if you can't help them, it's still helpful to them. And even if they die, even if that person dies, they are, they would, if they could speak, still be so grateful for the intervention and mm. the effort that was provided on their behalf. So it's yeah. sort of a semi-spiritual thing. It's not, I don't mean it in a, a literal spiritual sense. I mean it in a sense of, of in the imagination, of the well, it could be genuine, <laughs> genuinely spiritual, but I guess I mean to say that the first responders, often as they're working through it, will make some kind of emotional connection with that living being, and the right. living being says, "I am thankful for what you did. What you did was enough. It was enough what you did." Okay. And that they are, um, they give themselves through therapy what they can't have in re- in, in real life, which. Uh, to have the person say, thank you for finding my body. Thank you for, um, uh, taking care of me in, in, uh, in that, in that context. Not many people could have, um, um, been with me at that time, but you were with me at that time because you could be with me and you were with me even though it was hard and I, I, how grateful I am as a, as a dying person or as a dead person, um, that, uh, that you handled me with such respect. Wow. And yeah. a lot, a lot of people, when they get to that part of the therapy, as this woman did, you know, she was completely, um, almost, it was right in front of my eyes, it was, she was really restored by coming, getting into touch with that, not just intellectually, but deeply emotionally, as, as, uh, as I've mentioned, EMDR often helps people to do. So she, what she told me was that she's, you know, she, she'd, um, in sort of recovering the memory of the, the, the discovering this person's body, that when she stood up and she said she looked in the mirror, and yeah. as she, because she was in the bathroom, this person's body was discovered. She, right. she, she stood up and looked in the bathroom mirror, and what her words to me were was, I looked in my own eyes at that moment, and at the time, you know, it was terrifying, but what I realize now is that I was looking into the eyes of my best friend. Mm. And I thought that was a wonderful, wonderful way of saying she realized that she was there not only for the deceased person, but truly there for herself in, re- in terms of recovering that memory and kind of making peace with, uh, with it because she was able to get to this place of remembering what the core values are and, and knowing that she had in fact fulfilled her core values even though she hadn't, that person had passed away many days before she even arrived at the house. Right. Right. So it wasn't about saving the life. It was about um, fulfilling the values uh, as as um, uh, I- I- even when the opportunity for saving the life has passed. Yeah, no, that's so true. I mean, it's a good reminder, like what we're talking about right now, that you know, like you say, our the we're usually first responders usually are type A personalities, and we want to help, and that's why we get into what we do, and everything that you said is totally true, and it. It's also our, I don't want to say it's our greatest weakness, but it's also what gets us into trouble if we don't, if we don't take care of ourselves or don't remember to take care of ourselves. That push to help others and disregard ourselves is, is what can get us into trouble, especially when we start to 
to have PTSD issues and not recognize them? One of the things PTSD really does is it erodes a person's self-respect. Mm. Uh, a person is uh, feels like a failure. They feel uh, um, uh, unequal, and they feel like they've done poorly or badly. Uh, and they and uh, even for having the symptoms at all, they get, they get down on themselves for that. And um, I guess what can happen um, in a in a therapy that goes well is someone is they regain that self-respect and they regain the sense of I am someone who. Who, who, I'm not in it for the money. You know, yeah, yeah. if we were in it for the sure. money, we would have picked other jobs. But, <laughs> yeah. but they're in it for, um, you know, to, to, for, for these higher values that they have, that they espouse, and that they live those values. And that living values, whether you are, uh, you know, um, whether you triumph in the end every single time. No, you're not going to triumph every, in the end every single time. No one's going to do that. In any walk of life, but that the values themselves are worthy and these people, and the people who are first responders are deeply, deeply worthy people, no matter how, um, uh, how the call went or no matter how uh, nothing takes away from the dignity of what they're attempting to do, uh, no matter what, no matter how the story ends. Very true. Very true. That's recovering that and actually feeling it, feeling it in your heart. That can be, um, that can make a person feel so much better and can go a long way towards helping, um, put bad calls, terrible calls in their correct place in the memory and in the, in the in nervous system. Um, yeah. Say, you know, that it, it's not just, oh yeah, yeah, we did our best. It's deeply feeling I did my best in that and that and that, yeah. uh, and that I, I, I did not fail that. That person, the the person on the other end of that call. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard. You got to get yourself to that mindset it. in order to get better. It's just so. Sometimes it can be so difficult. You just you can't see the forest through the trees. That this that's is, where you got to get to. This is it. This is it. And so you know, it's a complex process. But that's. But just you know, just to the listeners out there, to to have a thought about what is it you deeply believe. What's the most important thing to you in life? Uh, you ask that question of some people and some people say, oh, it's making a million dollars. Oh, it's going to Hollywood. Oh, <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. you know, it's something like that. But m- m- most people will answer, you know, family and career, you know, um, right. and, you know, that people talk about doing well or, or connecting with nature or traveling the world or, you know, some other kind of thing is, is their values. But, but uh, first responders almost always say my my values are you know human life and family and you know my giving giving those are my values. Very true. Thank you very much, Robin, for giving us some some insight into just how our our values can, can you know get us into this career in the first place and and uh, things to watch out for as well. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Now, Robin, did you have a, a story to go with that, or was was your story the story? I guess my story was the story, a Perfect. story yeah. about how someone, yeah. you know, just to right. say that that person had been off work, that person um, was completely recovered, went back to work. No, <laughs> that's up, cool. And I, they went back to work, and, uh, you know, later on, I recall uh, being with them at a workers' compensation challenge situation that they were in, you know, over, over the whole claim and so on. Yep. And at one point... Um, you know, she was asked by lawyers to sort of what you know, what do you talk tell us tell us about your symptom history? And I remember her saying, as uh, I, I had been asked to sort of describe how she what her symptom history had been, and when I I spoke first to these lawyers, and I, after it afterwards, she said to me out in the parking lot, she said, you know, when you're saying all that, I couldn't even remember being that way. I couldn't even remember having. It was like you were talking oh, about wow. someone else. She's that is how effective her therapy had been. Um, you know, mm. she, cause she was able to, through her work, completely recover from the impact of that, of that really bad call. Perfect. No, that's, that's great. Well, thank you very much again, Dr. McGee, for joining us. And, My uh, pleasure. excellent. And, uh, always, uh, as always, be safe until we talk again. And, uh, we'll talk again soon. You too, Sean. Thanks. And there you have it. We've wrapped up another episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, again, as much as I did making it. Thank you again for listening, uh, everyone, and for supporting the podcast. Again, if you, uh, however you listen to this podcast, if you can subscribe to that, 
channel. That would be great. Also, leave feedback if you can and rate the podcast. That helps us get recognized. That would be awesome. Also, we're looking for questions for Dr. McGee for future episodes. So if you have a question pertaining to mental health or PTSD that you'd like to ask Dr. McGee and have her answer on the podcast, just throw me a message from my website, uptalkpodcast.com, and we'll get it on a future episode. And that would be awesome as we're looking for some engagement from our listeners. Again, thanks to our sponsors, and you can uh, look them up at the website. Again, uptalkpodcast.com. Until next time, I would ask that you take care of yourselves and each other. Because we ain't superheroes, we're just ordinary people Trying to make a difference, and the first on every scene And it's a heavy, heavy burden to carry